Sure. Give a big hand and welcome Sanjeev. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you very much uh, to the faculty and students of uh, Flame for uh, inviting me here. Special thanks to Yugang for arranging everything and uh, Professor Kamdar also for host hosting me here. Um, so the topic that I have chosen here is about process reforms, uh, big impact from uh, small changes. So the question that is an obvious one to ask um, is what on earth are process reforms? Now you know that we have been reforming our economy since 1991. So that's not a new news. But you see, most of the time you hear the term structural reforms, right? So if there are structural reforms, it uh, stands to reason that there must be other kinds of reforms also. Because after all, why qualify the word reform with the term structural? But unfortunately, in the economic literature, in fact, in most uh, of the conversations, you never hear of any other kind of reform. You only hear structural reform. So the first question is, what on earth are structural reforms? So structural reforms are reforms where you actually attempt to change the structure of the economy in some fundamental way, i.e. the underlying architecture of the system has to be changed. So I'll give you some examples. The original 1991 reforms, the de-licensing and liberalization was a structural reform. It's a fundamental shift in the way things are done. More recently, the reforms that you have, for example, the GST. GST is a fundamental change in the architecture of how indirect taxes work in this country. So the, basically, we went for a system where there were all these interlocking systems or at the state level, each state with its own indirect tax system, and then we suddenly changed it to a national system. Effectively, a free trade agreement that India signed with itself. So that is a structural reform. Similarly, insolvency and bankruptcy code. So we created the architecture of how to do creative destruction in India. So the insolvency and bankruptcy code changed the nature of creative destruction. Before that, if a company didn't do too well, you were, it was sent to something called BIFR, which is basically a warehouse for dead companies where they would be kept alive on large public expense uh, forever and ever till you know, some of them simply died out, but large, of the, large numbers of them were kept alive on uh, uh, half a life, and with huge waste of resources, effort, etc. Again, a change in, in the system. However, I'm going to talk about process reforms. Process reforms are actually mostly the nuts and bolts, boring reforms that you may read about in the fifth page of the of the newspaper. Somebody in that particular sector may actually know what happened, but these are not reforms that, at least, most academics bother to write about. Even those who carry out those reforms will maybe say, speak about it here as an individual standalone reform, but there is no focus on this as a, as a class of reforms. In fact, it may surprise you to know that I have actually invented the term process reforms. It came out in the economic survey about four years ago, and since I've tried to popularize its use. But the reason I want to focus on this is because unless anything is written about and, and, and institutionalized, as a th way to think about things, it does not become something that's a matter of course. Now, process reforms, although they are small, let me point out their impact may be very large. And the purpose of a process reform is not to change the structure, but to take a given structure and to make it that much more efficient. And very often the impact, the cumulative impact of doing this very often can be very large. And in fact, over a period of time, you may actually end up actually changing the structure of the system as well. So this is the kind of reform that I'm going to talk about. Nuts and bolts reform, small changes that very microeconomic sometimes, very focused perhaps on a specific sector, but ultimately hundreds of these small reforms that have been done and the reason the economy suddenly feels like it's more efficient comes from these small uh, changes. And there are literally thousands of them to be done. So let me give you a flavor of the kinds of process reforms that can be done. Well, the simplest one is just take an existing administrative system and process and just make it more efficient. I'll give you, I'm going to take you through ex live examples of each one of them, just so this is just to give you an overview. So something 
administrative process nothing very deep take whatever it is and just make that process a little more efficient administratively no need to change regulation rules nothing second change the regulation given the law i e there's a the law under which an activity is happening but the administrative regulations have to be changed so just so that you are aware basically when a law comes out of parliament it's not like the law is what is actually affected under that law certain rules regulations etc forms processes are created by the ministry and the activity whatever it is happens under those rules and regulations and the law is invoked only if some some major uh, you know deviation happens so here what happens only the regulation is changed given the law the third type of thing is that you have to go back to changing the law itself so this is a little more complicated you have to change the law there has to be a parliamentary committee then or whatever at the, at the state level it's a legislative committee whatever then it's debated it goes through lok sabha rajya sabha finally it goes through the president it's it, there's a gazette notification then the new law comes then on the basis of that some new regulation comes now that's more complicated but that's also another kind of process reform fourth adding capacity of some level of uh, of government to remove bottlenecks so there are many places while as a government you may say it's bloated etc but there are parts of the government where there's a bottleneck there just aren't enough people processes capacities institutions you may actually need to create capacity at some level of government to open out that bottleneck so that's another kind of change you can make and finally removing a requirement or some state mandated activity which is becoming a bottleneck so one is to add some capacity somewhere actually removing a process or capacity which is getting in the way of other people so all these kinds of process there may be other ways of doing it which i haven't thought of but uh, this gives you a flavor so let me take you one by one through the kinds of uh, reforms so this is administrative streamlining now let me tell you each one of them is an something i have personally worked on and they are live examples either they have just been done or they will be done or in the process of doing so these are things that they are not theoretical um examples at all so here is an example of administrative streamlining this is the simplest kind of process reform and it's carried out by merely streamlining a process so i'm going to take the example here of voluntary liquidation of companies so this is not companies that go to the insolvency and bankruptcy court because they've gone bankrupt or something bad has happened to them these are perfectly good companies for some reason they need to be shut down the person who was running those that company has you know wants to retire can't find anyone to sell it to wants to shut it down it could be a restructuring of a large company so one of its sub companies needs to be merged or just shut down or whatever it is um it could be that you know the entrepreneur realizes that while this is a pri- this is a profitable company today it can clearly see that technology is changing consumer behavior is changing for whatever reason he wants to shut it down so there may multiple reasons thousands of companies every year want to just shut down but voluntarily shutting down companies even when there is no case there is no tax there's no problem there's just a perfectly good company just want to shut it down doing this sadly is not an easy thing to do in india it can take years to shut down a company just because the process is very complicated now there are two ways in which companies can be shut down in india voluntarily so not talking one of them is the section 248 of the companies act of 2013 this is the more important rule uh, route because this is the simpler one and i'm dealing here i'm telling you about companies with which there are no cases and you know there's no problem so it's not like there is a dispute somewhere and then there is section 59 of the insolvency and bankruptcy code so although the insolvency and bankruptcy code is meant largely for companies that are insolvent or bankrupt there is a segment for voluntary shutting down so there are the two routes the first route is the preferred route because it's the simpler of the two now in june 2021 there were 28536 companies pending with the ministry of corporate affairs who wanted to shut themselves down and out of this 10 of them were pending for more than 1000 days and 54 of them 54% of them were pending for more than 1 year 
Now, this is, there is no problem with shutting down these companies, but yet it takes years to shut down these companies. Why? And there's a similar problem with the IC, IBC, there are fewer number, but again, you know, a, a, a large number of these cases could be shut down. So we decided to investigate why is it there's nobody that uh, n nobody wants to, uh, ob nobody objects to shutting down these companies, so why can't they be shut down? Why does it take so long? Why do you, why, where are the bottlenecks? So one of the things about process reforms is that you literally have to dig in and see step by step how long it takes. It's very painful thing to do, one of the reasons people don't perhaps do this kind of research, but hopefully some in the room will be inspired, Yogank is there if you like doing this sort of thing. And we discovered that there were two reasons why things were getting stuck. This is for section 248 uh, companies, there, are, there were two basic reasons. One was that you, it took a lot of time getting permissions and no objection certificates. And you had to do it in sequence. So you had to go to get permission from the tax department guys, the GST people, various other people you needed NOCs to shut it down, shut down the company. Fair enough, you need to get an NOC uh, from the tax department to shut it down, but you had to do it in a certain sequence. Now there is no particular reason why this should be done in sequence. After all, if uh, you know the registrar of companies saying it's okay, why does it require him for some other, you know, various different tax departments to Why does GST need to know whether income tax has a problem and vice versa? They can do it parallelly. But that is not how it was done. There was a certain process. It was not, it was done sequentially and not as a parallel. But the bigger problem is the most ridiculous of all. You see, in order to shut down a company, you have to actually uh, publish this in a newspaper. You have to... The company that wants to shut down has to publish in a newspaper that we want to shut down. The idea being that if there is any creditor, anybody who is owed something uh, uh, by that company, they can come and make a claim because they know the shut company is being shut down. Because once it's shut down, it disappears, right? So, and it took, turned out that this was the biggest bottleneck. It took literally years sometimes for the uh, Ministry of Corporate Affairs to publish the name. Now, there were many reasons why this took long time. Not the least, we discovered that it, it required you to, uh, let's say, the, use the word encourage the junior official who published these uh, uh, advertisements in the newspapers. Um, I'll leave it to your imagination how the encouragement went. Uh, but the fact is, this particular bottleneck meant there were thousands of companies in the country that couldn't shut down because the ad had not come out. And there was no reason that the ad couldn't come. Now, when we identified this and I made this presentation, the relevant uh, senior officials refused to believe me. They said, it can't be the case. So I said, no, okay, let us go and show it to you. So we literally showed it where this bottleneck was. And after that, what we did is we began to so they accepted it to their, to, to their credit and the secretary of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs of that time put in an extra effort, to provide budget, got around the various excuses usually given for delay and then there was a burst of publication of these, of these company names. Um, so as a result of this, what has happened is that there's been a dramatic speeding up of the process. The same thing happened with the IBC. It turns out that the no objection certificates that were being asked for, first of all, were not even required by the IBC route. And even if you wanted it, they could all be done sequ uh, parallelly instead of sequentially. So the impact was very dramatic. So what happened is, as of July 2023, not only have the pending cases reduced, remember, from 28,000 or something like that, to now there is only 8,820 cases. So just in two years, the pending number went down from 28,000 plus to 8,800. And only about 12% of them, down from 54%, that are pending for more than a year. Now, this is a very small thing in the system. It didn't require changing anything. Just needed to find out the section officer who happened to issue the advertisements. And that was it. And there are thousands of people who benefit from this. 
Now this is not earth shattering, this is not GST, but it has suddenly made one small part of the system radically more efficient. So that's what um, this uh, process reform is about. So let me now give you another example of a change that this has a much bigger impact on the system. And this relates to OSP regulations in the, um, uh, in the telecom uh, uh, IT BPO sector. Now it turns out that India's IT sector and the BPO sector and more generally the IT enabled sector had these strange rules which were imposed by the telecom ministry on the BPO sector for allowing them to function. Okay. Now how did I discover this was also an interesting story. You see, what happened is that, you know, we all work from home, everybody casually works from home. So I assumed that, you know, there were no regulations, anybody can work from home, it's not a problem. So when the COVID lockdown happened, the telecom ministry came out with a suddenly a notification saying that for the time being, we are allowing everybody to work from home till December 2020. So this is, this is March 2020 and some notification in end March 30th or something comes out that till December 2020, these rules do not apply and you can work from home. Now I have worked now by that time long enough in government to realize that they, when, uh, when an, uh, a ministry is issuing something like this, what they are signaling is not that they are giving you uh, some space, but that they are telling you that in normal times these rules apply. That is what the real message is. So immediately my antenna went up and I decided to investigate what were these rules that apply in normal times that didn't allow you to work from home. So I then discovered that while most people were working from home and they were not being interfered with, IT enabled services, however, would, would not let you work from home. Okay, so if you came from the IT enabled services world, you couldn't work from home. You had to actually go to the telecom ministry and ask for all kinds of uh, requirements. And this was done through a bunch of uh, uh, OSP uh, uh, rules, which were called the revised terms and conditions of other service providers of 2008. This was the rules under which, now nobody who was not in the ITES sector would have any idea about this, but was the bane of the life of anybody who was managing an, a, a BPO or call center or any such activity. So the first problem was that there was no clear definition of what this uh, OSP was. So all of this was under a general category called other service providers, which was not defined. So literally anybody could be an other service provider. So depending on who they wanted to randomly impose these rules on, they could just define it however they wished. So that was the first problem. The second problem was Technically, if anyone was doing anything, any business activity using a telecom line, then technically they were supposed to have an EPA BX machine in the basement. Now, I am quite certain that nobody below the age of 40 has any idea what an EPA BX machine is. Yeah. And yet, you were supposed to have one of these things in your basement. Now, this is EPA BX machine, just so that you have no idea what this is. Is an electronic private automated branch exchange. This, <coughs> and, you know, in the this is a technology from the 80s. Even in the 90s, I think it was becoming outdated. But they insisted you had to have one of these machines. So technically, till this rule was changed, if you're working from home, you were supposed to have one of these machines in your basement. And certainly, there is no question of putting stuff in the cloud and all that kind of thing. I mean, all of that was technically illegal. Third, you had to have a separate registration for every OSP. So if we were working from home, every OSP was considered as a separate entity and you had to register it with the telecom ministry and ask for specific permissions. Right, so utterly cra crazy. So working from home is, I mean, every home had to be you know, properly inspected by the, supposedly by the telecom ministry and certified. And then, even more weird, you couldn't share facilities between domestic and international OSPs. 
So it was, for example, supposing you were British Airways or Singapore Airlines or something, you had to have separate facilities for when the call center phone call came in, if it came from outside India and which one came from inside India. Now, you could be fined for the wrong phone call going to the wrong call center. So now, how on earth does Singapore Airlines know where the phone call is reached? After all, I can buy the ticket in Singapore, come to India, make a phone call saying, you know, I have a problem with my ticket. Now, how does the call center know where on earth came from? The phone also may have a, a foreign number, Singapore or US or any other kind of number. This was crazy. In any case, it doesn't allow for economies of scale because you have to create two separate systems for doing this. And yet, there were severe fines for violating this. So, as I told you, I discovered this whole thing by completely by chance. And then, having discovered it, I began to dig in. And after several iterations, it, didn't, it required quite a lot of pushback. I finally, first in November 2020, we managed to create uh, changes. These changes were interpreted in ways that uh, were not quite having the effect, so we had to further change them in June 2021, where we had to explicitly state that many of these old rules did not apply. And so as a result of which, we now have a very clear definition of OSPs. They only apply to a certain very small group of companies which do uh, voice-based BPO services, which is now a rapidly shrinking number, so it doesn't matter anyway. Two, interconnectivity and infrastructure sharing between OSPs was allowed. So, you know, uh, you know this business of EPBX, etc., doesn't matter. You, you know, you can use the cloud if you wish, or you can use a foreign EPABX, uh, or anybody else's EPABX, it doesn't matter. Work from home and remote locations was allowed. So it was now legal. All of you are being, being illegal all that while, so you're now actually legal. And we removed the distinction between domestic and international OSPs. All of this was got done, and as a result of which, let me show you what a big, big change this is. So when this change got done, then, which, you know, this was something outside of that field nobody knew. But when it got done, there were large numbers of people from Nandan Nilikini to uh, Mohandas Pai, all of them tweeted, oh my God, we never thought this will get done. Right? So let me tell you how big this is. Obscure reform, but let me show you. When it, NASCOM did a survey in December 2021 to look at the effect of this change, and what did it find? That 92% of people in the IT BPO sector said that OSP reforms help reducing uh, compliance burden. So this is the impact of it, 92%. Of that, 28% said that it reduced it by 50%. Okay, and almost everybody saw, uh, you know, major changes. So there were, uh, between, you can see the percentages. So, uh, so huge dramatic lowering of the compliance burden, the management time, the harassment, the rent seeking, all of that that was going on as a result of this change. Uh, similarly, whether the OSP reforms will make voice-based services more competitive globally? Absolutely, 94% said so. Which removal of the local EPBX uh, requirement helped in improving uh, ease of doing business? 85% said so. And so on and so forth. A positive impact on industry, you can see massive, everybody said, all of the above, all of these things had a huge impact. So the point is, obscure reform, I'll be very surprised any of you have even heard of this reform, but this reform single-handedly meant that in the years 2021 and 2022, there was a sudden digital shift in the IT, IT, uh, uh, ES sector, and uh, literally, Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of jobs got done because of uh, created because of this one change. Because our competitiveness just went one digital shift up. Now let me take you to the third type of uh, legislative uh, third type of process reform. The example I'm going to use here for how legislative changes are needed is through something called legal metrology. Now, how many of you even know what legal metrology is? 
How many people here know what legal metrology is? Nobody. Okay? So let me tell you what legal metrology is. Legal metrology are the set of laws that relate to weights, measures, labels, and things like that. Again, very obscure thing you would think. I mean, this is a, you know, weights, measures, who cares? No. And by the way, the law that on which it's based, the Legal Metrology Act of 2009. So this is not some, don't blame this on the British, some ancient law, etc. This is a relatively recent law, the Legal Metrology Act of 2009. And in case you suffer from insomnia, this is your best bet. <clears throat> now, this law, which is meant to protect consumers, which is a fair thing, and most, almost every country in the world will have uh, legal metrology laws. I mean, they are mentioned even in the Arthashastra and so on. So, these are really, every country has these laws. But the problem in India was that we had criminal provisions for these laws, which meant that, and it was set up in a very peculiar sort of way. So it was set up in a way that if you did one error, whatever that mistake may be, you were fined. And then on your second instance, if you did a second um, mistake, uh, then the entrepreneur, or even members of the board, etc., could be sent to jail as long as seven years. Okay, so it was severe punishment for doing it a second time. Now, it may seem ex ante that this is a reasonable thing to do. I mean, you're repeatedly behaving badly. So let me tell you what the data shows. So we'll just take any one of those years. You can see it on the table. So let's say you take uh, the, uh, you know, you can see that somewhere between 1.2 uh, lakhs to uh, uh, 75,000 cases every year in the first instance are recorded. So these are the no number of cases about, or let's say about a lakh cases every year <coughs> happen from uh, the first instance. So these are people who have done some uh, mistake, the, you know, it's a, they're selling, the label is incorrect or whatever it is. So about a lakh cases every year are booked under this. But the number of cases that are booked for the second instance is only four, five, six cases. Now, this was for a long time used by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs to see, see, these laws are so wonderful. Once we have threatened them, they've never come back. So, as usual, you now know that I'm a suspicious sort of chap. So, I began to dig into this data. And what we discovered is that this is one of the, possibly the single largest source of rent seeking in the entire government. Basically, what happens is that the legal metrology inspector turns up somewhere and finds some very minor uh, thing, you know. For example, gram is not written in correct form, is written G only or some. And by the way, many of these laws are, are at the state level also. So there are all kinds of complicated laws. So supposing you happen to make biscuits for the whole country, now under GST you can sell them anywhere. There are diff slightly different rules in different places, the labels are slightly different, or you may be one gram off or somewhere, uh, your weightage, or something may be a little bit off. The legal inspector will say, look, this is just a small infraction. Pay a thousand rupees and you go. So the, the, the entrepreneur will say, chalo, I've gotten out of this, so he'll pay his thousand rupees. But now he's committed the first offense. Now he is a slave forever. Because whenever he commits a slight, similar, small mistake, he can be sent to jail for seven full years. So you can imagine the amount of rent extraction this happens. And by the way, this is, this is accumulative, right? So every year about a lakh such cases happen, and they are being added on to the roster, right? So there are literally lakhs of cases of people, of entrepreneurs who have done one small labeling mistake or some small infraction, and they can all be sent off to jail on any equally small thing. There is no grading, by the way. So the second uh, offense can be a very minor offense as well. So net result of it, not surprisingly, large numbers, nobody is uh, uh, filed in the court of law because there is no incentive to doing this. You just put a first case and then you have a slave for ever. So we looked into this case. So some things began to be done against this. 
The first attempt to sort of ease things up were done under the Jan Vishwas Bill of 2022. Some of the most obvious ones were removed. So about 30 percent, 20, 30 percent of the criminalized section uh, of the cases now can be gotten rid of. But we are still struggling and pushing against, and we'll get it done, sections 30, 33, and 36, which account for something like 70, 80 percent of the case. These are still criminalized, and we are examining them, and we have to uh, change them. So if you happen to be reading the newspapers and you hear some obscure place that Legal Metrology Act 2003, sections 30, 33, 36 have been changed. It is not a minor change. Nobody is going to put it on the front page, but it's a very, very big reform that we, will have, we are trying to get done. So this is the third type of uh, process reform. Now I'm going to come to a fourth kind of process reform. This is relates to where you need to actually add some uh, state capacities. Now, we all know that, you know, we want to go into the knowledge economy. This requires that we have a proper system of intellectual property rights. So, IPR ecosystem is a very important thing. Um, you probably taught about this in your, news, uh, in your classrooms. But what actually happens in our IPR system? So, till as recently as 2016, so that's not a long time ago, uh, seven years ago, India used to see only 45,000 patent applications a year, much of this, by the way, by MNCs, and we used to only grant 9,800-odd patents, 9,800-odd patents. Compare this at that time to 3 lakh patents issued by the U.S., and 4 lakh patents issued by China in the year 2016. So you're going to play in this game. You can't be doing you know, less than 10,000 patents a year when your countries you supposedly uh, want to compete with are doing 3, 4 lakhs patents a year. You know, never mind, you can debate the quality, etc. The point is there's a clear level difference. So since then, we have improved things, added people, and improved processes, etc. And India's number of uh, 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 grants has, in the year 2022, dramatically dropped, jumped up from less than 10,000 to around about 34,000 patents were issued. There was also a dramatic increase in the number of filings, as you can see. And interestingly, many of these filings now began to come from Indians rather than just MNCs, which were regularizing their existing patents from outside. Now, that's good progress, by the way, uh, you know, a, a more than three times increase. But as I said, in the same time, China has now begun to do almost 8 lakh patents. Now, I will clarify that many of those 8 lakh patents are low-quality patents called utility patents. But even decent patents, they are doing about 3 lakhs. That's not so bad. And of course, the U.S. does now, their number has also gone up by... 3,25,000 patents. So they are patenting, and this is, by the way, only for patents. So similar numbers are trademark, copyright, etc. Although there, India does much better in comparison, but still, patents is where the game is, so I'm just showing you. So we again investigated why did it take up to five, six, seven, eight years to get your patent in India? Because what's the point of getting your patent in eight years' time? The technology has moved on, somebody has copied it, all kinds of other things have happened. So this is a ridiculous situation. <laughs> So we hunted, went into the system and we discovered interestingly, while there were problems in our processes, the real big problem was that this was one department where we didn't have enough people. So we had, we have last year, we had the number of manpower employed in the patent office was only a little less than 900. Okay, compare this with 13,700 in China and 8,132 in the US. Now, no matter how good our patent guys are, you cannot compete. You just cannot compete. So you simply need more people. So we began to do something. We began to get our processes going and we sped them up. So there are two levels in the patent system. One is called the examiner level and the second level is called the controller level. So you go through two steps in the process. And so, as a result of some improvement in the processes, etc., the examiner level, as you can see, the number of pendency has dramatically gone up. That the red bar 
has dramatically gone down in the last five, six years. Dramatically lower. So the examiner level guys are pushing it up. But because we don't have enough people to do the proper controller level examination, all that we achieved is that it piled up at the controller level. Now in the last one year, we have begun to speed that up as well. But you can see that unless you have enough people, this is not about process improvement. You actually need boots on the ground. And so a big effort has now been made to hire people into this sector. So from 800, we want to now take this number up to somewhere in the range of 3,000 over the next 18 to, uh, to 24 months. And that in itself will dramatically increase the uh, throughput. In fact, in this financial year, we are looking at number of patents granted will be around what? Somewhere in the range of 50 to 60,000. And we should be able in about two years time to do over a lakh. So one lakh patents a year is what the target is in about 18 to 24 months time. So this is the kinds of, again, reforms that we are doing. Now, finally, I'm going to show you the last kind where we want to, we remove a state mandated requirement. Now, I want to make the point here is that many often the people are in the impression that many of these inefficiencies are there because of some laws the colonial period left us. Well, come on, 75 years have passed since then. Most of the problems in our system are self-imposed. Let first of all be absolutely clear on this. Please don't blame colonial era, British, Mughals. These are all post-independence and in fact many of them are very, very recent additions to our problems. So let me show you what um, happened here. So you may have heard, you, how many of you are aware what mediation is? Do you know what mediation is? So mediation is essentially a process, a legal process by which before going to the court, you bring two people to the table, the two parties who are in dispute, and try in a non-antagonistic way to settle whatever their differences are. And it is fair enough, till now it was being done in a somewhat informalish kind of way, it is fair enough that we had a law to do this. So we first introduced a law for commercial cases, and then more recently we tried to introduce it for civil cases using the Mediation Bill of 2021. So when the mediation cases for 2021 were being introduced, there was something in there which I found quite interesting. It said that we are going, there are so many cases in the system, so what we need to do is to make it, we should make it mandatory that people have to go through a mediation process before they can get to court, otherwise the courts are getting clogged. It sounds very reasonable. And it turns out that there was already such a clause for commercial cases. Yeah, that if there's a commercial dispute, you have to first try and mediate, and then you go to court. Sounds all very reasonable. Let me tell you what a disaster it has been. So, what happens effectively is that effectively, in all, all commercial cases, in order for them to go to courts, go through this problem. So, there are the, uh, these are the number of cases. So, these, this is the data from two uh, these are, uh, so these are the number of cases, this is a survey of cases from two Mumbai uh, district courts which do commercial cases. So Mumbai is a good place because it's a financial hub of the country and two district courts where we have data so we analyze this and we looked into what happens to case, uh, cases that come in and uh, 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 get done. So this only really started relatively recently from 2020 onwards. So really it's the data in the last two, three years that really shows what happens. In fact, look at 2022 where we have the last full year data. And you can see that in the last full year data in these two courts, something like 7,717 cases were disposed. Out of which only 1,039 were actually settled. 1,039 attempts were made to mediate and they failed. But in fact, the last majority, 98% of those cases were non-starters. Neither of the two guys wanted to mediate. So effectively what happened is by making it mandatory, I, you had to go through this process, you wasted four to five months. You paid lawyers, wasted time, and nothing came of it. For a tiny number of settled cases, 139 cases, 
you had seven four four three one cases plus the failed cases of one thirty nine. Those are the failure cases. So to get you know non starter plus failed cases were ninety eight ninety nine percent of the cases were not going anywhere. And yet you stuck the whole system and got everybody to uh, uh, you know um, pay legal fees etc. Now as with everything, I have mocked. Bureaucrats and uh, and and inspectors and so on so far. This was a classic example of the legal system extracting rent. The lawyers love mediation. It's three months of free money, three five months of free free money before the game gets going, right? And they all know that nothing happens out of all of this, but they love it. So when the mediation for these uh, civil cases came, the parliament asked for this kind of data. And the discovered is on work. So, for, thankfully, for civil cases, now it is not mandatory. The new law that's come in, it is made voluntary. But we still have the old law, which mandates that it should be for um, uh, uh, it should be for uh, commercial cases. So, we need to go back and change that law. And I'm be publishing a paper. I've already written about it in the newspapers, and I'll be publishing a paper uh, just this week on why commercial pre pre-litigation commercial uh, uh, mediation should be made voluntary because making it mandatory essentially means that you're forcing everybody who doesn't want to go through this the system now of course there's going to be huge opposition to this because obviously uh, uh, you know there are several people who make large amount of money by doing this but we have to push back because if you don't push back against these small little wrinkles in the system these each sec these small small wrinkles in the entire system add up to make the jam up the entire system and i've given you now large number of examples of how these small wrinkles in the system the process inefficiencies removing them cumulatively has enormous benefit for the economy as a whole so everybody focuses on structural reforms but in fact the argument i'm making is that these process reforms are just as important as a part of policy yes they are boring and somebody has to go into the nuts and bolts and you know tighten something loosen something and so on but this is something that people who want to be interested in policy need to pay attention to it may not be so cool but you need to write about them you need to investigate them and one at a time you have to begin to uh, smoothen them up and this has to be done you know through a feedback loop so you make a few changes see what happens feedback loop make more changes and so on and over a long period of time very often the cumulative impact of this is that sometimes the whole architecture of the system may also change indeed very often large structural changes eventually work because after introducing the change you see what the unintended consequences are and you try and fix it after all gst when it was introduced was full of bugs but should we have looked for a perfect system no we would never have done it the only way to do it is to introduce it introduce the structural change and then feedback loop your way through process changes and then we have now a system that is reasonably good it is not trouble free there are lots of bugs in even today and there will be 30 years from now when you will be running the system you'll still be fixing bugs but as a result of this iteration this system is now radically better than whatever system we used to have talk to anybody who used to do business before gst and talk to them today and 99.9% of them will say that the system today is much much better not perfect but much better so the point uh, i have trying to make before i conclude and open it up to q and a is that look there is this entire class of reforms process reforms they need attention they need attention from policy makers they need attention from academia they need attention from people who want to go into this field and open their eyes to this in huge field of research that you can do so you don't have to go out there and do some grand uh, thing that you need to change changing these small pieces piece at a time is just as much a contribution to um, creating india as you know uh, as a global 
economic powerhouse. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.